the end guard is like a first stage of genetic engineering, and then the bull guard is they improve the process of genetic engineering. And so this just shows how it affected the use of insecticides. Okay, yeah, and this one is for cotton in China, also trying to show the general trend of the de decline. Uh, this is changes in secondary insect pests due to the deceit crops. So the secondary insect uh, tend to increase with the decrease of the targeted species by the toxin. Um, uh, they aren't susceptible or they have susceptibility reduced um, compared to the specific uh, targets. Um, so they tend to increase and um, with the changes from broad spectrum insecticide to the DC crops. Um, secondary insects increase are suggested to do with the DC crops, although the increase in the DC cotton and DC maize um, this shouldn't undermine technology, but there should be research so that farmers and regulators are aware of potential risks in the future. That's something that the chapter wrap up. Um, so with the resistance evolution, um, targeted insects are resulted in an economic loss for farmers with DC crops and the resistance to the DC toxin has uh, shown researchers and farmers and the public that uh, genetically modification technology is not sustainable. Um, the high dose refuge strategy for delaying evolution of resistance to the DT toxin was successful, but DT, um, DT crops has decreased the population of certain insects pests. So I had the effects related to herbicide herbicide and existing crops. Um, so in 2015, um, there were many variants of herbicide resistant crops used on many types of plants. Um, the report gave five just uh, very commonly used ones. And so the most uh, popular herbicide resistance is gliophase resistance. So that helps control those weeds and stuff on the right. So first off, we have soybean. Um, so there was a study in 2013 for the US, Canada, Argentina, Argentina, and Romania, and it showed no difference in the yields of uh, genetically engineered herbicide-resistant crops and non-genetically engineered herbicide-resistant crops. And so this kind of, um, like the no, uh, no difference in the yields kind of was a, a pattern shown in most of the plants uh, overall. Um, you can see in 2014 there was four cases of an increase, three big increases and one small increase, four no differences in yields and one decrease. In Brazil and Iowa in 2014 and uh, 2008 there was no difference and then in Missouri they had, um, they, it was an experiment with two different plots of one genetically engineered herbicide resistant crop and one without and you can see that there are there was a difference in yields between 2,688 kilograms per hectare to 2,013 kilograms per hectare. For maize, most of the studies, um, like looking into the effects <coughs> of herbicide resistant crops, are from the U.S. So they had three sites in Michigan. Two showed no difference, and then one showed a herbicide resistant advantage in yield, so the herbicide resistant crops produced more. Um, in 2000, in Illinois, the first year, um, the herbicide resistant crops actually had a low year yield compared to the non uh, genetically engineered crops. And so the second year, the numbers actually jumped, and so researchers concluded that because of like temperature differences and temperature swings in the first year, that the herbicide resistant genetically engineering kind of uh, made the plants sensitive to it. So, and then the, you can see in the Philippines, um, there was nine plots studied, and so six showed higher herbicide resistant cro uh, crop yields, and three had lower. So for cotton, herbicide resistant cotton is super widely used, so there wasn't much information on that in the report that was obtained. Um, 
these are just in canola. So in Great Britain, there was a three-year study, and this study found that um, genetically engineering the canola to be fertilizer resistant actually makes them less invasive, and uh, it kind of helps with better weed control. And so in 2003, uh, Canada study showed that there was as high as, uh, there were greater yields as high as 39% found for the herbicide resistant crops, but mostly um, there was like no difference or a small increase. So for sugar beets, um, herbicide resistance kind of helped them produce more sucrose in the sugar beets, which kind of made them like sweeter and stuff. Um, there was higher yields in Wyoming for herbicide resistant plants, but there was um, like a similar sucrose level in each particular plant, but overall, like in the whole harvest, there was higher sucrose level. And then the experiment couldn't be reproduced because herbicide resistant plants were widely adopted. And then so herbicide resistant alfalfa is rather new, and this makes like there's not a lot of data out there, and because it's a perennial plant, it's also going to take longer to study because uh, all the other plants I've covered were annuals. And so just overall for all the plants, um, herbicide resistant plants usually allow for greater yields and better weed control. All right, um, changes in, wait, let's see. You get switched up. Uh, yeah, so changes in herbicides due to the herbicide resistant crops. Uh, basically, like Adam was saying, um, the, the, the scientists have pretty much gone in and modified the crops to help them save money and better control the crop that they can bring in. Um, so basically what they do is they go in and insert that into the plant genome and the proteins created, uh, which kills the target insect that is attacking the crop. Um, so over time, uh, with the use of these modified crops and stuff, this this graph here kind of helps with this. Are you talking about herbicide resistance or pest resistance? Um, herbicides. So there's no target insect in this. Um, kind of switched up a little bit, but um, this graph helps with this one and the next one. Um, so over time, the the crops they're applying less herbicides to the um, plants and stuff, um, and you can see at the very beginning. For, I think it says 1995. Is that right? From 1995, there's a slight decrease um, in the amounts of uh, effect. And then over time, it's not sustainable. Um, it kind of depends on what the, what the farmers are choosing to do and the, uh, I guess, power or um, toxicity of the stuff they use. So go to the next one. And then the yield effects of the herbicides and insect resistance. Um, like I just said, from 1995 to 2015, um, there's been a big reduction in that gap he was talking about again with basically um, how much they can potentially bring in and then how much they really bring in. Um, so this is pretty much, it's helped a lot with the farmers and stuff. Uh, but yeah, um, there's room for improvement a lot in the near future is what the, the reading said. Um, here in the next couple of years, they expect uh, to learn a lot more and be able to even farther this and, and bring in more new crops. environmental effects of GE crops. So the study generally found um, that BT crops generally increase biodiversity, um, but that was with, with um, sorry, without insecticide, it generally decreased, however. Um, they ran a whole bunch of tests later with a whole bunch of more species, um, but still found the same results. And so when we look at this graph on the, uh, we have the change in time on the bottom and then the percent of planted acres. And so we see as uh, the years go on, people start to use more and more uh, BT crops, uh, her herbicide resistant crop <coughs> crops. Um, and so based off the results, as they use more of these BT crops, um, they should have a general increase in biodiversity. Um, herbicide resistant crops and weed biodiversity was the next thing we went over. Um, and the study showed that weed diversity in farms was due to location and not the cropping system. And basically what the cropping system was is they rotated three different kinds of herbicide resistant crops. Um, the first rotation was only one type of herbicide resistant crop. 
Um, in the next study, they did uh, two, they rotated two herbicide resistant crops. And then the last study, they did one herbicide resistant crop and then one non herbicide resistant crop. Um, and they found that it was uh, weed diversity had to do with location, so maybe type of soil where there were rivers nearby, stuff like that. Um, and then when weeds were controlled by a single application of glyphosate, uh, there's typically greater weed diversity and abundance, and Miles talked about gly glyphosate was uh, herbicide resistant, basically. Um, genetically engineered traits on crop diversity. Um, so going over this again, continuous cropping was three or more consecutive years of single crop. Rotational cropping was they rotated between what crops are farmed each year. And then so when we look at this, blue is rotated cropping, red is continuous cropping, and then we have uh, maize, spring wheat, and soybeans um, over the years. And we can see that most farmers uh, uh, did rotating crops. But what the study found is that genetically engineered crops with herbicide resistant or insecticide resistant uh, traits benefited farms <laughs> without rotational cropping because it reduced tillage, which is tillage is basically just preparing the land um, to be farmed. Uh, it reduced pesticide use and reduced reliance on crop rotation for weed insect control. And then reduced the use of herbicides with long residual times. And that last one is um, basically good because um, that if herbicides with long residual times uh, basically hurt crops um, that were used for rotational. And so I think, I don't know if the report can encourage this for farmers, but it seems like it wanted farmers to possibly think about moving away from rotational cropping to continuous cropping because it had a whole bunch of benefits, um, which would increase biodiversity. Conclusions about environmental effects. The committee found little evidence to connect genetically engineered crops to environmental problems, and that was because of mixed evidence of BT crops. Basically, the BT crops sometimes um, harmed biodiversity, but also sometimes benefited it. There's lots of uh, mixture in there. Um, so they couldn't really um, say that BT crops were the cause of environmental problems. There were many outside factors. Um, the report gave some, like maybe the farmers don't have all the financial resources there to increase biodiversity. Um, and basically the cause and effect, cause and effect relationship between genetically engineered crops and environmental problems can't be definite because the complex nature of assessing long-term changes was too difficult. And uh, Buck also, <coughs> or the chapter also made an argument that the people who adopted these genetically engineered crops to start were in general like better managers of their farms. And because these guys were better managers, that could be a reason why their potential, or their yields were higher initially, just they were straight up better farmers. Right, so in the final section, it talked about the effects of genetically engineered crops on the environment and ecosystem. And just like they said in the last slide, for the most part, all the arguments gave about how genetic, like, G crops harming the environment, the rebuttal was there's not enough information to say that, that G crops are the direct effect of this. Um, firstly, um, talking about the transfer of crops going onto unmanaged lands. Uh, GE crops already present in fields. Didn't, there's no evidence of decrease in biodiversity. But then the expansion of row crops, this is just farms getting new land. And over, there was wetlands, conservation areas, um, grasslands that hadn't been tilled in over four decades. Um, and a big reason was for this was the Conservation Reserve Program. This is a federal program that paid farmers to take over wetlands and grasslands to plant new crops. And um, 520, from 2006 to 2010, 530,000 acres uh, or hectares of land was taken from these conservation areas to be used to produce more 
crops. And this was mainly because the demand for biofuels and food was increasing. And in South America, the glyphosate resistant soybeans, in 2010 as well, there was a big expansion of soybean farms, but this was also during the time that GE crops were being introduced there. So there wasn't really, they couldn't directly correlate the two of the expansion being the reason, or GE crops being the reason for the expansion. Um, so the big question is like, are GE crops the main contributor to biodiversity loss? And they, in the chat, in the section that concluded that it's not directly the cause. Um, secondly, it talked about the effects of GE crops on monarch butterflies specifically. So BT maize, the pollen, it would go through the air, land on the larva of the butterflies and cause them to not be able to grow, which caused the population to decline. decline. And so on this, I'm gonna walk over here real quick. But on the figure, it just shows the density of the pollen grains per centimeter squared versus the percent of growth inhibition. And as the, as the pollen grains became more dense, you can tell this is for BT-176, which was the main toxin um, of the glyphosate um, or for the BT pollen. And as the, as the pollen grains increased, the larval growth inhibition also increased, which is the same as the decrease of the growth. Um, then they went and talked about the reduction of milkweed plants, which milkweed is the main food source for monarch butterflies. And in Iowa, there was a study of milkweed plants around genetically engineered fields that had, or genetically in, in, engineered crop fields, and there was a 90% decrease of the milkweed plant. And then also, away from GE crop fields, there was only a 50% decrease of the plant. But as well as this, the migration of the butterflies, there was irregular weather patterns during this time, and so they claim that because of the decrease in milkweed plants and the, and the irregular patterns of migration, that the decrease in the butterfly population cannot be directly resulted from GE crops. Um, gene flow is just the cross-pollination of genetically engineered crops to wild plants. The main uh, concern was that the GE plants would it, or the wild crops would inherit the GE plants traits and cause too much competition in, in nature, um, which would in turn cause biodiversity loss because there's some plants that would not be able to compete with, say, the, like a glyphosate trait into a wild plant. It would overpower the other plants that didn't have the herbicide resistance. Um, and basically they said that there's not enough evidence to prove that competition in the wild due to gene flow is the direct cause of well, why GE crops are bad for the environment. And then the final thing it discusses um, reduced tillage. Reduced tillage, um, like they said, reduced tillage is just uh, not tilling the ground because it per, per decreases erosion and it also decreases gas emissions because you're using less equipment. Um, this also makes the soil stronger because you're not losing as much topsoil. And it's a positive cycle between the HR crops and no-tilling because GE crops put a lot more nutrients into the ground. You're not tilling up that ground, causing it to lose the nutrients. So better soil promotes better growth for the plants, better plants produce better soil. And it's just a continuous cycle. So. <clears throat> That's a final statement. All right. Nice job. Thanks. Um, yeah, you got a question. Uh, I'm sure. I hope you got a question. Questions from the audience? Well, this is pretty left field. I don't know if the uh, report talks about it. You mentioned in 19 New York one in the very beginning there was an increase in insecticide use with a really big spike on the future funds. Did it say that they lost? Uh, say that, can you say that? You mentioned yeah, 
there's uh, why was there an increase in the second slide? It was side? in the cotton slide. Yeah. The very first this slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which they might not have talked about. Um, they were more just trying to show the general okay. decline of. Yeah. So they, they didn't have any explanation for that huge bump up in they, ICU or something like that. I can't recall it off the top of my head. Okay. okay. I think it did state um, that this reduction in insecticide, insecticide, I can't even say it, was noticeable between non-adapters and adapters, but the decrease in general was because of, um, in Europe mostly, was because of the corn borrower population decrease. Yeah, but that, the Aiden was asking about that, yeah. that big spike in, in like the, uh, just the green. I can't recall off the top okay. of my head. Right. That's well, that's Google. And that is, that is cotton, isn't it? Yeah, that one's cotton. Other questions from the audience? Aiden's question was a question I have, but more of my questions that you guys ask to the questions I have to ask. As I ask my questions, if anything additional pops into your head, then, then feel free to jump in. So Adam, um, you talked about potential yield. Mm -hmm. um, did they mention how this is generally calculated? It seems like it would be something kind of difficult to get a handle on. Um, I just, they just talked about, they probably did give like an equation. I just know potential yield is supposed to just show the possibilities of crop production. Okay. Ruth, um, you mentioned something called high dose refuge method in your section talking about kind of how to prevent, how to prevent uh, the target pest species from becoming resistant resistant to, for example, the Bacillus thuringiensis talks and make them do some, do some genetic engineering. <coughs> but you didn't really talk much about what that is about. I explain what the high dose refuge system or, or method is. Mm, I'm sure the chapter did talk about it, but I can't remember off the top of my head. So it's when you glean anything from it by name. Can you guys go to the slide where it mentions this? Yeah, so on this slide, you basically talk about there's concerns about the evolution of target insects, evolving resistance to uh, these crops, um, and as a result, if they do evolve resistance to, to the, these toxins, uh, then these things might not be sustainable. And then it says the high dose refuge strategy for delaying evolution of <coughs> resistance uh, to these toxins was successful. Anybody, anybody on the, in the group, you all have read the chapter. Do uh, you guys remember what this this method is? What the strategy is? Uh, yeah, it was. I think essentially um, the pests had a better chance of evolving if the genetic engineering was introduced at a slower rate. The high dose refuge strategy, I think, is just intro introducing a, like, 
very high percentage of genetic engineering crops instead of having a diversity of. So what's the um, refuse part? So this is a method that's used both with with genetically engineered crops that are engineered for pest resistance as well as the application of fertilizer uh, of, of pesticide. It, it works in both in both ways. Let me actually just turn the board and I can aim for a picture that will probably illustrate it as easy as anything else. So whether you're applying pesticides or whether you're um, planting BT crops, it doesn't really matter. But the idea would be that on your farm, you have places where you've planted your crops, and then interspersed in between where you're planting your crops, you have refuges where you don't have your crop planted. And a lot of times these will, these will be planted with small trees and shrubs and things like this. They do a couple of things for the farmer. One of the things that the presence of trees does is it serves as a windbreak. So when you do have the soil of your fields exposed, you get less erosion, less loss of topsoil due to wind erosion and things like this. But the other thing that it does is it, it provides a refuge where <coughs> insects live. And so if you have plants that have been engineered with BT toxins in their bodies, uh, any of these insects that come over into here get killed when they eat the plants because they they eat they ingest the BT toxins and the BT toxins are toxic to to the insects. But if there is a particular insect who happens to have a mutation that makes them resistant to resistant to this toxin, it'll survive. It'll eat out its little section of of the crop. But if it goes back into this refuge and intermingles with other members of its species, that gene gets very quickly bred out of the population because you have one insect that is resistant breeding amidst this population of a bunch of insects that are not resistant. And it's very difficult for a gene to take hold if they're just like one copy of it in this, in this ocean of other genes that are not resistant. Same thing if you're spraying a, herb, uh, spraying a pesticide on this field, if you just spray the pesticide where the crops are, once again, insects come into the crop, they get killed by the pesticide. If there are a couple of individuals who have a mutation that is resistant to the pesticide, when that individual goes back out into this refuge, once again, its resistant genes just get kind of swamped by the presence of all of these non-resistant genes in this refuge. And so you'll oftentimes see, even in fields where you're planting kind of hedgerow to hedgerow, as, as Earl Butts would have you do, you will oftentimes see these strips of uncultivated land interspersed within, within the field that provides a refuge for insects to be where you're not killing them off, where you're not exerting natural selection on them constantly, which would lead to the, the, the development of resistant strains. And so this is a strategy um, this is a strategy that's useful for, for slowing down the rate of the evolution of these resistant, resistant strains. Um, are you guys familiar with MRSA, MRSA? Those of you who are athletes, you ever go to the gym and the, gym, the locker room is closed because of MRSA and they're cleaning <laughs> the, yeah. well, of course not, you guys have been going to school mostly during the pandemic, you don't get to go to the gym anyway. Uh, anybody been there? It's like a MRSA, right? Hmm? MRSA? MRSA? Yeah. It's a methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. MRSA. MRSA. Hmm? What did you just say? Methicillin <laughs> resistant Staphylococcus aureus. What? Oh. Staph aureus, it's a, it's a common skin bacterium. Um, it's the kind of bacterium that you get when you have little pustules on your, on your skin, pimples and stuff. Um, those are because you have an infected, an infected follicle or an infected sweat gland. And the bacterium that causes that infection is the Staphylococcus aureus. And so it's, it's, some people call it Staph aureus, but it's also just the S-A 
in MRSA. The M stands for methicillin. Is it just staph? Yeah. Like staph yeah. infection? Yeah. It's, it's a staph infection. Sorry. Staphylococcus aureus. It's a staph infection. Yeah. It's, it's staph. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the science in me coming out. Methicillin is an antibiotic. And so one of the problems with, with using antibiotics, you guys are laughing at me now, <laughs> great. Um, one of the problems with using antibiotics is that the more you use antibiotics, the more likely you are to have strains of bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics. And the problem with Staph aureus, Staph infections, um, is that they're so common that we use antibiotics against them a lot. So they've become resistant to penicillin, they've become resistant to anthromycin, they've become resistant to essentially all of the antibiotics that we throw at them. The last antibiotic that we had that worked against Staph aureus infections is methicillin, and now there's even a methicillin resistant strain of Staph, of the bacterium. And so whenever they detect this, like in a locker room, they're really common actually in, in college locker rooms as it, as it turns out. Um, What's that? That is gross. So occasionally, so, so back before we, we avoided contact with one another, there would be usually one or two times a year when they would actually close the locker rooms down in the Navy Center. They would go in there and they would bleach the heck out of everything uh, because somebody had caught a methicillin resistant staph infection. So the way you do this is by just not prescribing antibiotics when you shouldn't be prescribing antibiotics. So, um, well, for one thing, two things. I have personal experience with this. This killed my younger sister. Uh, she was, it was 2005. She went to the hospital on a Friday for a totally unrelated issue, picked up Staph aureus in the hospital. Hospitals are also excellent places where Staph aureus, where, where MRSA hangs out. She picked up staff from the hospital, got home. Uh, she was dead by Sunday. Sunday evening. I was in Puerto Rico doing field work, get a call from my family saying, you know, Michelle died, you need to fly home. I had nine students there working with me. I abandoned them, left them with an older student. Uh, so this is really hard to control because you don't have an avenue for, for combating it. Um, and so then a number of years ago, I went to the doctor and I had a sinus infection and I didn't know if it was viral, I didn't know if it was bacterial or whatever. And um, I was pretty sure it was bacterial, but the doctor couldn't tell if it was bacterial or, or viral. And she wrote me a prescription for, and I like this doctor just fine. Uh, had her for years until she moved away and, and established a practice someplace else. She wrote me a, a, a prescription for a, a general purpose, broad spectrum antibiotic. And I'm like, why are you giving me an antibiotic prescription? And she's like, well, because I think it'll clear it up. Like, but you don't have any evidence, you haven't run a culture or anything else to see if it's a bacterial infection or if it's actually just a viral infection. She's like, yeah, I know, but I've been, I've been seeing a lot of people in with symptoms similar to you, it's something that's going around, uh, and the, this particular antibiotic has been working for them. And so I took the prescription, and then I went home and I didn't get the antibiotic, I just, I just wrote it out. <laughs> until I was well because I don't want to be taking a uh, an antibiotic for an infection that might actually be to, due to a virus because as it turns out, antibiotics don't work against viruses, they only work against bacteria. And so if it is a virus, you just kind of let it take its course and, and write, out, write out the illness unless there's a particular antiviral drug that works on that. Um, so the way we keep methicillin resistant staph infections low is by not taking antibiotics when we don't need them so that when an antibiotic, antibiotic resistant uh, pathogen crops up, it doesn't have a bunch of, it, it's not in a community of bacteria that are, that are antibiotic resistant. And bacteria, they share genes with one another a lot. Uh, they do what they call lateral gene transfer. And I think I mentioned this back in the, in the section when we were talking about genetics. And so, um, you kind of dilute the effect of those resistant strains of bacteria by keeping them in a population of non-resistant strains of, of bacteria in the same way that you keep these occasional resistant insects in contact with a big population of non-resistant insects so that those genes don't, don't then just kind of take over the insect.
this comes back to something that I, I'll have to go back and look at my notes that another one of you um, mentioned that, that is similar to this. Does that make sense to everybody, how, how this system works? Go ahead. Um, anybody else have questions while I kind of get, get back on the right page? Uh, you may have already kind of addressed this and I might have missed it, but um, you talked about how secondary insects were starting to um, rise in population because they weren't being killed off by the insecticide. Um, does, does your reading talk at all about like potential danger of that, or is there just already in place a plan to genetically modify more insecticide for them, I guess? I think the study as a whole was more of like an observatory, like uh, it wasn't like giving suggestions for the future or anything. Like that. No, it only just proposed that there was potential risks that may avoid danger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, let me just follow up on that. I was I was a little surprised about how sometimes um, the use of a BT plant that would normally be designed for killing insects actually has the potential to increase biodiversity. Was that due to the fact that it creates space for these other species that aren't necessarily part of that cropping system to have more ecological space, less competition, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. to function? Was, was that the reason that they attributed to that rise in biodiversity? Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it specifically said that uh, because the BT crops only targeted specific species, that the secondary insects had um, the opportunity to kind of take over. JT, can you go to your, your first data slide? I was interested in kind of tying in that. Yeah, I think I got them. Um, There's a, a slide about herbicide mm -hmm. use. It's coming up. <coughs> yeah. So could you just kind of walk yeah, us this through one. that slide? Yeah. yeah, that one right there. Um, yeah, honestly, I think I mixed a little bit of the insecticide stuff too. Yeah, um, but, but aside from that, think about the the, the, the graph alone. The graph oh, okay. Alone. Oh, just um, go through yeah, it. Go through it the way the way we kind of talked about going through a graph, where you explain what the y-axis is, you explain, okay. what, explain what the x-axis is, and the y-axis is, and then you tell us what the lines are. Okay. Yeah. So the green, um, these are all showing the herbicides. So the green one is cotton, um, blue is corn or maize, and then. Um, purple is soybean. So um, on this side we have the, the kilograms per planted he hectare, I think is how you say that. Yeah, um, a hectare, if, if you guys have been using that term a couple of times, we've seen it a couple of times. What is a hectare? Isn't that just like a hundred acres pretty much? No, it's not a hundred acres. It's a it's a square plot of land that's a hundred meters by a hundred meters. So think of it like a, a football field but square on the long yeah. axis. So it's just a standard unit unit area, but that's about the, the size of it. Um, so, so what's happening with the with the trend in the use of the herbicide? And what what's the first year on the on the x axis? Um, the first year is 1995. Okay, um, so this right before they introduced um, genetically engineered crops into the in the cropping system. Okay. Yeah. So and then it goes all the way to 2010. Okay. I think my next. 15. Um, so yeah, and like I said, that chart kind of goes from this slide and then the next. Um, this one does a little bit better job of explaining it. Um, okay, explain it with your graph. Yeah, so um, you can see that like when they when they introduce these sort of things, they decrease um, right here. And then uh, just over time, like from 1995 to 2015, like I was talking about, it um, they just haven't been successful in sustaining like what they've been doing. So what, do mean, what do you mean by that? So it looks to me like initially herbicides, herbicide use drops, which is weird to me because now you're using the herbicide as a different crop. So it seems like herbicide use should go up. But initially, at least for some crops, it goes down. Yeah. And then it starts going up, but not at a rate that great for any of the crops really by, I guess that's about the year 2000. Um, 
Uh, yeah, is that 2001, 2002, yeah. Okay, so, so, so it starts going up. So this confused me because it seems like if you have an herbicide resistant crop, that would just increase your your use of herbicide because you're using the herbicide because of greed rather than using tillage. So why am I not seeing this huge increase? Yeah, um, that's the thing that they were kind of talking about in the reading too is that um, it's kind of like trial and error a little bit. So. Um, like it's not sustaining over the time, so they're still making adjustments and, and stuff to all these crops that they're they're modifying. Um, and in the next, I think it said five to ten years, they're they're going to be like it's expected to shoot way up because like like Adam said, this is pretty much like a new process in the last twenty years that they've been doing this. So, um, has have you guys heard any? Yeah, did you have something? I was going to mention our uh, the economic portion that we read. Uh, it mentioned that a lot of small scale farmers actually uh, they like started using these uh, uh, genetically engineered crops, but they could not uh, afford it to keep going. So they use it at first, and then they kind of stop using it afterwards because they just couldn't afford it. <coughs> this is going to be good as we go through these these presentations over the course of the next day and a half or so. Um, when you have things from your chapter that might inform things from another chapter, it's good to speak up about that because then it gives us all kind of a more integrative view of kind of what's going on with things. These chapters, even though they stand alone with chapters, there's stuff in one chapter that might actually relate to something in, it in another chapter. This is a good example of that. Which is why I want you guys to talk to one another about this rather than just listening in the back of the room uh, to learn all this. Yeah, Dave, you've got a question. What was the relevance of Um, so it's the introduction of the BT toxin, like our herbicide resistant, yeah. and then the pollen from those plants transferring onto the larvae, or lar larva, causing the population to decrease, like decrease. So okay. it's affecting the population of these monarch butterflies. Are the butterflies eating the plants? Are they doing it? They are not. They are. So it talks about the milkweed. The main food source is the milkweed plants, and then it talks about how milkweed plants by herbicide, like BT crop farms, um, there's a significant decrease in the production of the milkweed plants. So there could be a uh, correlation between G crops killing the milkweed and not like that's another reason that the population would decline. But like at, at the end of every section, they just, their claim was there was not enough information to be able to directly correlate G crops to the degradation of the of ecosystem. So uh, on this front, um, do you, since this was your section, did you look into anything else about the life cycle? You mentioned migration of monarchs. Mm -hmm. Where do these monarchs migrate to? Um, Mexico, like okay. down south for the winter and back up for the Yeah, for in Michoacan, the, the state in central Mexico and in these forests up in the mountains. Uh, what's been happening to those forests in Michoacan? Continually decrease. Yeah, I was gonna size. Say. yeah, people are going to chop down those yeah. forests. And so that has two effects. It gives them less habitat to try to build a winter in. And the other thing is, those forests have a moderating effect on climate. And so they're up in the mountains. And when the mountains get cold at night, the trees themselves act kind of like a blanket trapping in the heat of the ground so that the, the mountains don't cool off as much overnight as they normally would. And so there's more prevalence of frost. So monarch populations have been declining, and they're probably declining for lots of different reasons. <coughs> Things that happen in the United States with pesticide use, and maybe, maybe or maybe not the use of BT crops. Things that are happening <coughs> in Brazil in terms of deforestation. One of the really complicated things for scientists to do is to assign causality to something where you have a pretty small insect. I mean, monarchs are big butterflies, but they're pretty small in the grand scheme of things that have this huge range that they interact with over the course of, of their entire lives. As we convert more land over to agriculture, we have fewer milkweeds. I plant milkweed plants in my yard every year so that monarchs have something to eat uh, as they're coming through. Um, but as we plant more acreage in agriculture, we have fewer overall milkweed plants on which they can lay their eggs and have 
RV to feed on, coupled with anything else involved with agriculture, like pesticides and maybe or maybe not some of the crops, coupled with deforestation, it's just really become difficult to say, ah, this is the core. You know, this is the, the core of the, the, the driving monarch populations down. And um, it's something I think that scientists struggle with, and it might be something that you guys are struggling with as you read these chapters. So, um, Brendan, you kind of gave the, the kind of summary statements. Um, at the end of this, and, and this is open to Brendan or, or anyone else, actually, um, at the end of all of this, what's the, what's the verdict if somebody asked you, a random stranger come up, came up to you on the street and said, well, are gene crops good or bad from the standpoint of, of yields and you know, crop yields and the environment? What would you say? Well, for crop yields, it's definitely positive because it increases yield. And then for the environment, does it increase yield? Yeah, it's yeah, generally about 3%. Uh, somewhere in the or is it more subtle than that? Well, it just depends on, like, we're talking about the U.S. The U.S. generally is a was a 3% increase over time. But there's areas like the Philippines where there's studies where there's shown zero effect on yield at all. Do you generally see yield effects broadly under all conditions or only when certain factors kind of interact with one another? Yeah. Uh, well, I kind of talked about it a little bit, but it, it depends a little bit what the, the farmers are doing because there's different variables and stuff that, that contribute to that. What else does it depend upon? So correct me if I'm wrong, whenever you asked him about um, like what goes into percentage yield, I think per it's like... Potential yield. Potential years, yeah, sorry. But like, it depends on the temperature, the like amount of water, amount of sunlight. There's like the, the natural, uh, uh, what's the word? Yeah, like, I, yeah, natural factors that go into how much can act, like what's the total amount that could be. And then there's the limiting factors as well. So. Yeah, in Adam's section, you talk about how pest resistant crops, genetically engineered pest crops only really increase yields in places where there were a lot of pests. Yeah. In places where there weren't a lot of pests, it didn't have any effect because, of course, there were no pests to, to try and get rid of. So when you think about when you think about this particular chapter, it's kind of a mixed bag because whether or not a genetically engineered crop actually gains you much really depends on a lot of factors. One of the factors could be whether or not you have a lot of pests to worry about to begin with. Um, are your plants not only stressed by pests, but are they also stressed by, by water issues, drought and things like that? These crops, these genetically engineered crops, do better in places where there's water stress because they're not being hit by two stresses, pests feeding on them while also being water stressed. And so, I, I think I, you talked about this, right, Adam? Did yeah, a little bit. Well, I was just gonna mention that they said like, um, crap, I kinda lost my train of thought. Um, crap, sorry, I'll continue. Oh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, okay, wait, I found it. Sorry. <laughs> Just like, um, they want, it was important to mention that, like, in general, over time, yield increases. Like, it's very important to recognize that technology improves and yield will increase as time goes on. So I just think that's important. Yeah, there were a number of figures in the, in the chapter that you guys didn't include that showed general increases and they're kind of going up before they introduce genetic engineered crops, and they're still going up. They're going up kind of at the same rate after they introduce genetic engineered crops. So a 3% yield really isn't that huge of a yield. It might make a difference in terms of income on the farmer, but it's not like a 10% yield, which would probably be, well, it would be. But of course, there are, there are certain scenarios where there were much greater than a 10% yeah. difference. It just depends. Yeah. So that's, I guess that's one of the points that I want to make. In answer to this question, you know, are herbicide resistant crops and pest resistant crops better in terms of yields? The answer probably isn't just a straight black to white. Yes, it is good or, or no, it isn't good. It's probably an it depends type of answer. It depends on what the context is in which you apply those genetically engineered crops as a, as a strategy for increasing yield. 
Um, how do you feel about that? What do you think about that? I mean, I feel like it makes sense. Is that the answer you thought you were going to get when you started reading this chapter? Miles, you're shaking your head no. <coughs> no, I thought it would kind of be a lot more black and white. Okay. Um, why did you think it was going to be more black and white? I don't know. I just think that, like, if we're going to modify something, we should make it useful. And, or, like, if we were to modify something that's going to be such widely used, then shouldn't it have, you know, very positive effects on wherever it's being used. And why else might you want a, a more black and white answer out of this report? It just seems like the U.S. is so pro-genetic engineering that you would almost think that there would be like a, a very clear reason why we're so pro-genetic engineering. Any other reasons why you might be thinking a more black and white answer? I mean, you just hear about it so much about the, the genetically modified stuff nowadays it, like he said kind of you'd expect it to be doing more than two percent increase okay at least in the u.s and also this is a report like a thousand page report so you expect like they know what they're talking about they have answers so yeah so scientists are in theory in the business of finding the answers to questions and this is something that that comes out guys over the two years that I've been doing this, you, you get to, you know, you go to this chapter looking for an answer, and the answer will always be, that depends. Yeah, it's always, in my section specifically, it's always, well, this happened, but this, this is another reason. Yeah, There's always but, but what I want you to recognize is that's the nature of being a scientist. It may be frustrating to you to get that answer, but the nature of science is to find out what the right answer is. And if the right answer is that, well, BT crops can improve yield, but they only improve yield under these circumstances, if that's the right answer, that's the right answer, and you just kind of have to put up with the but about it. And um, if you think science is something that provides clear-cut black and white answers, you're gonna find science very <laughs> um, and so kind of embrace that seeming ambiguity the scientists who wrote the report aren't attempting to hedge their bets they're not being ambiguous but what they're doing is they're trying to present the best information that they have the best data that they have in the most correct light and so they're avoiding saying oh well, this is an unmitigated good or this is an unmitigated horrific thing, they're basically saying, well, it's good in these ways, it's not so good in these other ways. In some cases, they will say, well, we don't really know what the effect is. And in other cases, they will say, well, the effect is, is dependent upon the conditions. And you guys need to embrace that level of, you might, you might interpret it as wishy-washiness, but what it is, it's their attempt to, to be as honest and realistic about what the data actually tells them. And that can be frustrating at times. Uh, if you listen to scientists talk when they're being interviewed on news programs, <coughs> or on news programs on radio or on TV and stuff like this, you will see that scientists talk this way about what they do. They are very careful and measured about making blanket statements about this is unmitigatedly good or unmitigatedly bad. They are very much about the negative. And so for those of you who have presentations coming up, and this one took us the whole time to get to, um, just think about that as you, as you prepare for Wednesday, this idea that, that you should embrace um, that seeming level of ambiguity. That, that level of ambiguity That was actually
actually a pretty nice job. Good. Um, on Wednesday, where there's going to be less ambiguity, thankfully. Was that as bad as you thought it would be? Good. COVID? No, it's not COVID. Well, that's good. Um, well, are you going to be back on Friday? Yeah, I'll be on Friday. We have football at home. Okay. Um, let me send out an email to everybody, and we'll just we'll just switch the order. How sure. does that How does that work? Because everybody should have been ready to go today. In theory. Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. But so, um, yeah.